Welcome back to the short video series on the molecular quantum mechanics methodology. This third video will continue on with introducing the practical steps for performing a geometry optimization. In the last animation, we glossed over a lot of specifics. Now, we will describe the practical aspects of each step that occurred further. Choosing a starting geometry. Recall that because we are trying to find a global minimum, we want to start from a good initial guess. That is, a molecular shape which we believe is close to this global minimum. This is the first step, to generate an input geometry. There are many quick algorithms and builders in Material Science Maestro that can give us very good starting points, including 2D, or SMILES, to 3D transformation, force field minimizations, and conformational searches, which allow some crude skimming of the potential energy surface without actually performing quantum chemical calculations. It's customary to take the lowest energy conformation according to these methods, but we might want to start from several different minima. Beyond these algorithms, you may already have a 3D structure, which can be used as an input for your DFT geometry optimization. For example, a dot .sif of an experimental X-ray structure, a structure from the PDB, or another structure file from another calculation or coordinate database. Once we have read the coordinates, we need to select two essential settings. These are the functional and the basis set. It would be outside the scope of this video to give comprehensive definitions of these two terms. Let us use a very rough explanation in which we can use the Schrodinger equation to explain these concepts. Every functional can be thought of as a different flavor of H and E in the Schrodinger equation. Each functional defines the energy of the molecule. Theoretically, there exists the exact functional which would correspond to the exact H. Unfortunately, this exact functional is unknown. That is why we have multiple functionals, none of which is exact, but each of them strives to be as close to the exact functional as possible. In the last 40 years or so, scientists have gotten closer and closer to the exact functional by using better and better approximations. Jaguar has a huge selection of these functionals. We refer to the ever-improving series of functionals as Jacob's Ladder. The higher on the ladder that we climb, the closer we get to the exact functional. However, as we climb, the more expensive the calculation gets. For most calculations, we may stop somewhere in the middle of the ladder to balance the cost and accuracy. Switching now to the basis set. The idea here is that the quantum representation of the molecule can be built from representations of individual atoms. The basis set is a set of mathematical functions usually centered on atoms. We build the wave function of the molecule from these atom-centered mathematical functions. Different flavors of the basis set correspond to different flexibilities of the molecular wave function psi. The bigger the basis set, the more flexibility we give to psi. As basis sets are normally centered on atoms, we can picture basis functions as circles around atoms. More basis functions, more circles, and more coverage. In principle, basis functions don't have to be located on atoms and can be located in between atoms or in other points of space. Just like in the case of the functional, there exists a mathematical abstraction for the exact or complete basis set. This basis set would give the highest possible flexibility of the molecular wave function. However, this complete basis set is in general infinite and therefore unattainable. The larger the basis set, the higher the cost of the calculation. Even small or medium basis sets, which are far from the complete basis set, may make the calculation fairly expensive. For most calculations, it is good to use a medium-sized basis set to maintain a balance between accuracy and computational cost. Jaguar already selects a reasonable functional and basis set for you in the panels and workflows that you will learn in the course. These are presets, and so, in the simplest case, there is nothing you need to do. We will briefly describe some of the most commonly recommended functionals and basis sets that you will see. The notation and terminology for functionals and basis sets may at first look complicated and confusing. That's because it is. But don't worry, we will walk you through the most important aspects to begin. For functionals, remember that it is advisable to be in the middle of Jacob's Ladder to make the calculations accurate but not too expensive. B3LIPD3 is a default in many Jaguar panels. It is a good functional for geometry optimizations. MO62X is usually recommended for energy calculations. Omega B97XD was a special purpose functional which is now used more and more for general purposes. 
It is often recommended for treating charge transfer molecular systems and for predicting chemical reactivity. Notice the D in both B3LIPD3 and omega B97XD. This letter is commonly used in functional names to indicate that these functionals were explicitly corrected for non-covalent dispersion interactions. For basis sets, remember that we typically want to use medium-sized basis sets to keep a balance between accuracy and computational cost. Again, the notation and terminology for basis sets may at first look complicated and confusing, but it is not hard to become familiar with the most important symbols found in the notation. The stars, called the polarization functions, are especially important for accurate descriptions of bonding for heavier elements. You will also see combinations of letters DZ, TZ, and QZ, and sometimes even 5Z. D, T, Q, and 5 stand for double, triple, quadruple, and quintuple. Going from DZ to 5Z, we add more polarization functions. For example, for element carbon, a basis set with DZ might include D function as the most complex polarization function. For TZ, the most complex function is F. For QZ, it is G, etc. DZ is the smallest and least accurate, and 5Z is the largest and most accurate, but at the same time, most expensive. The pluses, called the diffuse functions, are recommended for accurate descriptions of anions and non-covalent interactions. In the case of CCPVTZ, the aug is actually equivalent to plus plus. See, we warn that the notation is a bit chaotic. If we were to recommend some commonly used basis sets, they would be the ones that we have shown here. 631 G star star is a general purpose basis set for geometry optimizations. CCPVTZ is a more expensive basis set adequate for accurate energy calculations. For anions and non-covalent interactions, use diffuse variants of these basis sets, namely 631 plus G star star and AUG CCPVTZ. For a universal basis set that supports both light and heavy elements, we use a flavor of the 631G family, namely the LACVP family of basis sets. For example, LACVP star star is essentially equivalent to 631 G star star for light elements, but it also supports heavy elements. Having prepared an input geometry and selected a functional and basis set, we can proceed to solve the DFT version of the Schrodinger equation. During the geometry optimization that we watched earlier, we simply showed a spinning wheel and then printed an energy value. Let's dig just a bit deeper. DFT equations are nonlinear matrix equations that are solved iteratively. Recall that in the geometry optimization, each step we adjust the geometry and try to minimize the energy as a function of geometry. Here, at a fixed geometry, we are iteratively adjusting the electron density so as to minimize the energy with respect to the density. Thus, we can think of this iterative process as being inside of the solve DFT equation step in our simplified workflow. Specifically, we need to start with some reasonable guess for the electron density or the wave function. Often, a reasonable initial guess is a sum of the atomic densities for each individual atom that exists in the molecule. We then solve the DFT equations iteratively until the energy no longer changes as we vary the electron density. In the context of a geometry optimization, once the DFT equations converge, the energy associated with that geometry is returned. That energy is the energy that we printed earlier for solving the DFT equations. And indeed, Every single energy on that list was generated from a similar inner loop of holding that geometry constant and adjusting the electron density to achieve a minimum energy. And so, we can modify our full picture to also include this second inner iterative loop. The penultimate step in the geometry optimization involved making a decision, if we want to go to the next geometry or not. How do we make that decision? That decision can be based on a number of criteria. Different quantum chemistry programs have different criteria for deciding whether we should stop the geometry adjustment process or not. The main criterion is the change of energy at each step. At the beginning of the geometry optimization process, the energy will change quite a bit. As the steps proceed, the energy will change less and less, falling below a certain threshold which we use as a stopping criteria. Here, the black dashed line represents the threshold for convergence. 
Once the energy clears that threshold, we stop adjusting the geometry and output the result. Actually, in practice, in addition to looking at the energy change criterion, several other criteria are used. For example, an additional criterion is the extent to which the geometry changes from iteration to iteration. As the steps proceed, the displacement of the geometry will eventually fall below a certain threshold, here represented with the red dashed line. Normally, four or five of these different criteria have to be satisfied at the same time for us to declare that we have reached convergence. Different quantum chemical programs have different criteria, and then those criteria can be adjusted by the user. If we have not reached convergence, the geometry is adjusted in the direction of the derivative of energy with respect to atomic displacements. Quantum chemists refer to this derivative of energy as the gradient. This is the direction in which the energy is predicted to continue to decrease. Actually, we calculate this derivative with respect to the displacement of every atom. Therefore, each atom in the molecule is adjusted separately. We adjust the atomic positions and then return to solving the DFT equations for the new geometry. On the other hand, if we have reached convergence, we output the geometry and energy, and the geometry optimization concludes. As we have seen, geometry optimization is a complicated procedure which consists of two types of iterative processes. While we could present an entire series of videos on troubleshooting problematic calculations, for the new user, it is only practically important to be familiar with the most common pitfalls. We can think of this like our familiarity with car maintenance. It is good to be able to change a tire, but for most of us, beyond that, we would recommend calling for roadside assistance. The inner iterative process minimizes the energy with respect to electron density for a fixed geometry. This is the solving of the DFT equations. We solve the DFT equations at each geometry step along the optimization. The second outer iterative process minimizes the energy of the molecule with respect to the geometry or the 3D coordinates of the atoms. This is the geometry optimization itself. We can say that the task of solving the DFT equations is embedded in the geometry optimization. There are two iterative processes, and if something goes wrong in either of them, our geometry optimization is not going to succeed. It is important to learn to troubleshoot the most common pitfalls in either solution of the DFT equations or in the geometry optimization process. The most common failure in solving the DFT equations is that the iterative process does not converge. In such a case, the energy often jumps up and down erratically, and the process runs out of the preset number of steps. A first approach to resolving this problem is to try to converge the DFT equations with a smaller basis set. Then, use the converged solution as a new starting point for the original basis set. It is tedious to do this manually, therefore, Jaguar automates this process with the keyword no fail equals one. If this procedure does not help, especially in calculations involving transition metal atoms, we can use a different initial guess for the solution of the DFT equations. This is achieved via a different setting of the keyword I guess. The most common failure in the geometry optimization process is observed for large and flexible structures that have multiple local minima. For such structures, the iterative process may run out of steps. An obvious first attempt to solve this problem is to start from a different initial geometry. If you are using the PBF solvation model, consider switching to the alternative solvation model called PCM. This method may converge the geometry faster and in fewer steps. The setting no fail equals one, which helped with the solution of the DFT equations, can also help with the geometry optimization process as well. This setting can help select the next geometry more judiciously. In general, we recommend using no fail equals one in all geometry optimizations, and many workflows that involve a Jaguar geometry optimization include this setting by default. In parts one and two of this video, we learned about typical system sizes for quantum chemical calculations. We explained why DFT is the recommended method for practical applications. Then, we walked through the multi-step iterative process of geometry optimization. We explained the overall process as well as each step in detail we provided some fundamental troubleshooting advice. In the next video, we will move beyond just geometry and energy and discuss other properties that can be extracted from a quantum mechanical calculation.